Every day, every single day, things are happening in the world of deals and deal makers. And there's never enough time to keep up with every company, transaction, announcement, or whatever. It's just exhausting. And we have a new product to help fix that. This is Axios Pro Deals, a new premium subscription product bringing you tailor-made insights like never before. For the last five years, Axios has helped deal professionals navigate the whole deal landscape with ProRata. With Axios Pro Deals, we're diving deeper into the industries that matter most to you. You just want stories on fintech? There's a newsletter for that. Medtech deals? We've got you covered. The future of retail? We'll guide you. With Axios Pro Deals, you're going to be getting all of this industry-specific insight and expert analysis at a level you simply can't get anywhere else. So if you're a venture capitalist, private equity investor, banker, trader, founder, executive, anyone who cares about deals, Axios Pro is what you need to help you understand what matters and why. Start your free trial today at AxiosPro.com. Welcome to our Axios Latino Impact at the Ballot and Beyond virtual event. I'm Russell Contreras, the race and justice reporter here at Axios, and I'm coming at you from Rio Rancho, New Mexico. And welcome to our audiences on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and on Axios.com. Join the conversation today on Twitter with at Axios and hashtag Axios events. Over the next 30 minutes, I'll be joined by my colleague Astrid Galvan. As the primary season kicks off, we'll be unpacking the top concerns and key issues among Latino voters. Our first guest is the president and CEO of Unidos US. Janet Morguia is joining us from Washington, DC. Janet, it's great to have you. Thanks for joining us. Wonderful to be with you today, Russ. Before we get started on our conversation about the Latino vote, take me back to yourself growing up in Kansas. Um, you are the daughter of uh, Mexican immigrants who came to the Midwest. Um, a lot of folks don't understand the experience of Mexican Americans in the Midwest in Kansas. Why did the community go to places like Kansas, Eastern Colorado, Indiana? It's a good point, Russ, and a reminder that many in our community have been in this country for generations and 
The draw in particular to the Midwest, uh, I know for many Mexican Americans, was jobs and uh, the need to fill these jobs, whether it was in the stockyards and the meat plants or in uh, different instances, it was the railroads and the steel plants. That became a kind of a line of migration for many uh, and why many communities settled across rural areas in this country. My dad happened to settle in Kansas City, Kansas and worked in a steel plant for 37 years. But yes, I uh, know firsthand that we as a Latino community and certainly Mexican-Americans, we're everywhere across this country and have contributed to the economy in many ways. And I've seen that firsthand in the Midwest. You mentioned jobs. Today, if we look at any poll, uh, poll after poll show that jobs remain a top concern for Latino voters, jobs, the economy, inflation. But yet when you hear politicians reach out to Latinos, it's usually just get out the vote. They focus on immigration concern, but not the top concerns. How do political candidates miss talking to Latino voters when they don't talk about jobs? Look, the economy and jobs and wages have always been top of mind uh, for our community in poll after poll. And it's something that's not news to us. But I think that many uh, candidates and certainly parties still can't quite figure out that they have to meet our Latino voters where they are and engage them meaningfully on issues of importance to them. And of course, we're not a single issue voter community. We care about a lot of issues, including access to healthcare, education, and yes, immigration. But the economy and jobs are always top of mind. And I think sometimes uh, that's not quite recognized in the way that uh, parties and candidates uh, should remember. Uh, for us, it's about the comprehensive approach that you can take to meaningfully engaging Latino voters. Every election, you know, we write stories about the Latino vote and we have to realize there are many Latino votes, but yet I, it's the same story where you have Republicans running candidates that some say target racist attitudes, Democrats run campaigns where politicians say, where uh, consultants say it's condescending. They just want us to get out to vote they don't engage us, they don't listen to us. What's the danger if we stay with this dichotomy and not engage Latino voters and actually listen to them? Look, I think there's danger for both parties and for candidates who don't recognize that, you know, look, our community is not monolithic and neither is the Latino vote. And they really have to talk to our community in culturally competent ways and understand that a Latino who lives in South Florida isn't the same as a Latino who lives in, in South, Southern California. Uh, we have differences of views. There are common themes that bring us together and there are common issues, but you have to meet the community where they are. And these voters understand that if you are not literally present uh, in a way where they are able to meaningfully understand the positions and uh, you know what you stand for, uh, it's not going to make the connection that you need to make. And the investments have to be there by parties and campaigns to not just be there on election day, uh, three days beforehand circulating flyers. You know, there's the saying, you have to be uh, present to win. But that's not just on election day. You have to be present for parties year round and make sure that the community understands the positions, the issues that are, you're promoting as a party and the candidates that relate to them. So for us, uh, meaningful engagement is key and having that level of cultural competency and understanding that our community has some common uh, connections, but uh, different views based on where they are. Now, you mentioned campaigns. Sometimes the campaigns aren't there, but YouTube is, social media is. 
And as you know, there's a lot of misinformation, especially targeting Latino men. What is the danger when you don't engage Latino voters and the voters then go to places like YouTube and start consuming misinformation about immigration, about COVID, about the economy? What's at stake? Yeah, I think you raised a really important point that we saw play out in, in many ways in the 2020 election. Uh, the Republicans had a very strong campaign where micro-targeting was key for many of the Latinos and Latino men in Southern For uh, Florida that was never really countered uh, by the Democrats. And where we saw issues like Biden is a socialist, uh, not really taken seriously or early enough by the Democratic Party, there were gains uh, by the Republican Party. So the micro-targeting is, uh, is a strategy, but you're getting to a deeper point where we have to be more vigilant, all of us, uh, about what kind of information is used on these social media platforms and calling for more accountability around the truth and accuracy when it comes to talking about our community and who we are and the information that is shared. And so we've engaged, I know the Congressional Hispanic Caucus and others have also with directly with social media platforms to get at deeper strategies that can help uh, flag and monitor those issues. But it's both a, a, a shield and a sword in some ways as candidates and parties are understanding that those are ways in which you can uh, reach into the community and there's not a lot of vetting of that information. So uh, some parties are using that to their advantage, but we have to make sure that one, that we're having accountability for those platforms and that we're seeing uh, ways to counteract uh, what are false information and narratives. But candidates have to understand that micro-targeting is going to be a strategy and one that you can reach candidates on and the parties have to be able to counter what is being used uh, more effectively. In our final two minutes that we have to, I want to ask you uh, about the, on the issue of immigration. Um, immigration tends to be the fifth or sixth concern, depending on polls for Latino voters, but a concern nonetheless. Democrats have had a number of opportunities to pass immigration reform. When Obama came in, he had 60 votes. Now we barely have, the Democrats barely have a majority. Should Latinos believe Democrats when they say they want to push immigration reform? They've had their chances. They seem to not have done it. What's the point? If you're interested in immigration reform, why vote for Democrats if they haven't done anything in the past 30 years? Well, look, I think the fact is, is that both parties are to blame and are need to be accountable for a result on immigration reform. We've seen uh, different periods of time where the Republicans have had a chance to address this issue and where the Democrats have had a chance to address this issue. But I think the bottom line is that there's going to have to be a bipartisan solution and both parties are going to have to demonstrate accountability, certainly to the voters and especially Latino voters who do care about this issue. We've gone too long with a broken immigration system that is creating a crisis in, in different ways uh, across the border. But we need leadership on both sides of the party and meaningful solutions communicated to voters, especially Latino voters. And I think uh, we need a solution that's gonna really reflect both the challenge uh, around immigration and migration, but really one that shows how important immigration reform is to strengthening our economy and the need to address a, 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 a lower workforce uh, that we are seeing right now and to replenish that workforce. So candidates and parties that come forward with solutions and understand that we're gonna have to communicate that in a bipartisan way, both parties are gonna be accountable. But I do think we're hopeful that we'll see some efforts, even administrative relief uh, for President Biden to demonstrate that we can get some work done in this space if we're not gonna get Congress to act. And certainly we at Unidos US are gonna be advocating for some of those 
executive actions around dreamers or TPS holders and and essential workers. That's what's going to be key for now. But both parties are going to have to be accountable to Latino voters in the end. Janet Murguia, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And next, we have a video from our sponsor. We help build a better future when we harness the power to develop new ideas. The power to demonstrate what we're made of. To be the role model our community needs. To be recognized for who we are and what we do. The power to have the same opportunities as everyone else. To break ceilings or to build bridges. To make things happen. To start something new. Y tú, ¿qué quieres lograr? What would you like the power to do? I'm Astrid Galvan, editor of Axios Latino. Our final guest is Texas Congressman and Vice Chairman of the Congressional Hispanic Conference, Congressman Tony Gonzalez, joining us from Washington, D.C. Welcome. Thank you, Astrid. Happy to be here. Let's get started. I'm really excited to talk to you as a fellow Texan, and I have lots of questions about Latino voters. Um, and first, I want to hear from you about what is different this year um, in terms of GOP outreach to Latino voters and, and specifically with you and your role with the Congressional Hispanic Conference. How are you guys reaching out to Latinos and um, how is it different than in, in previous years? Yeah, I always tell people the secret sauce is showing up. It's showing up early, it's showing up often, and it's being genuine. Don't try to tell people what you think they want to hear. Just be who you are. And, and that's how I won my race Everyone in the, the Texas 23, 800 miles of the southern border, stretches from San Antonio to El Paso. It's larger than 30 states. Everyone told me last cycle, Tony, you can't win this seat for all these reasons. And we proved them wrong. And part of that was we just showed up over and over again. You know, I announced my uh, candidacy in San Antonio, and my first stop was Eagle Pass, Texas. This is a very Democrat stronghold, and we just showed up. 22 times over the course of the election. So I think that's what is the, the difference. You know, and you're seeing that with RNC uh, centers that, were, that popped up along the border, as well as in San Antonio, McAllen, Laredo. Things like that are, are showing that the, the GOP is, is uh, heavily invested. Yeah. And, and how do you keep that momentum going? I mean, besides just showing up, like how else do you keep people engaged? Yeah, I'll be, it, look, the messenger matters. And, you know, being Mexican-American, having six children, being Catholic, being a Navy veteran, when I show up and I resonate with my district and I'd argue, you know, Maria Salazar in Miami and Carlos Jimenez in, in, in the, the Southern Florida area, Mike Garcia in California, you know, all that matters. And I think you got to take it to another point is it's, it's important for us to look after our races and make sure we come back but it's equally as important for us to look at other races and other engagement. You know, uh, uh, I'm working uh, real closely with Myra Flores, who's in Texas 34. You know, uh, I've spent time in, in McAllen. I'll spend more time in McAllen. Those type of things, I think, help candidates, you know, help them develop, help them show what a winning campaign looks like. But it also, I think, is important when they do win, they can come up to Washington and they can be, you know, uh, productive members of society, if you will. Yeah, and speaking of that, I mean, there's a record number of Latinos and Latinas running for um, seats in the GOP party, um, and like you mentioned, the one in in Texas. Um, what's driving that? What's getting? Because there's been, you know, long, uh, probably a misconception that Latinos are Democrats, um, and we're seeing, you know, we know that's not true, but maybe people are slowly starting to see that, and um, I'm just wondering what you think is driving that um, kind of increase in candidates? You know, I think part of it is just the culture of America in general going, wait a second, maybe things don't have to be the way they've always have been. You're seeing that throughout, across cultural lines. And I think the Hispanic community is no different. 
I think they're starting to question, hey, why am I a Democrat? When, what, what has my member of Congress done for me? What has the party done for me? And I think they're, they're starting to have a lot of questions. And I think what you're seeing is you're starting to see more candidates that have never run before, that have never entered the arena, if you will. Uh, and, and you're also seeing more support. You know, it takes a lot for uh, to win a race. I don't care even what what level of candidates, uh, what election you run for. It could be local, state or federal. It takes a lot to win any race, even more so if it's a congressional race. So I think you're seeing more organizations that are willing to roll up their sleeves, go to work and help these candidates be successful. Uh, but it also takes current members that are up here. And I've, I've, I've taken that very serious. How do I go to places like Monica De La Cruz in Texas 15 or Juan Siscomani in Arizona 6? And how do I help them by, by showing them? Right. Switching, switching gears a little bit, I'd love to hear from you about what you're hearing from your constituents. What are their really top line issues right now? There's so much going on. What, what are they telling you? Yeah, it's really two things. You know, my district is uh, 42 percent of the southern border. I have very urban areas. And then I have in San Antonio and the the suburbs of, of El Paso County. And then I have very rural areas. Uh, but the number one issue in my district is the border. And it's not even close. And, and they're really upset. Many people are upset. Democrats, Republicans, people that never voted. I mean, they're upset and the, the, sure, uh, the sheer amount of folks that are coming over illegally has created this, this very chaotic environment. And, you know, I'll say, you know, my district is very warm and, and welcoming. We, it weren't, it's, you know, immigration isn't a new topic. Many of my constituents are first or second generation Americans. Uh, so they're not anti-immigrant. I'm not anti-immigrant, but what you see is this chaos that is happening. I'd say that's the number one thing in my, my district, but also a close second is gas prices. You know, people, you know, if you have a diesel truck, you're paying over $5 a gallon. And, you know, my district isn't a wealthy district. It's a blue collar uh, district, a lot of agriculture, uh, you know, a lot of oil and gas industry in, in there. And, you know, you're paying $5 a, a pump at the, ga at the, at the, uh, the gas pump. Uh, it, it's hurting people. And a lot of people are upset with that. How is that, and, and particularly um, the issues around the border and the potential repeal of Title 42, going to play into the midterm? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be at the, the forefront of it. You know, one of the disappointments that I've had with this administration is their, their unwillingness to have a discussion on border security and immigration. And you know, I've been jumping up and down since uh, since I got elected. Hey, I wanna work with you. You know, every presidency has had to deal with border security and immigration and, and you know, President Biden is no different, but they've really taken this, we're gonna go it alone approach. And I think it's, it's, the, wrong, it's the wrong way to do things. They've really kind of forgotten those along the border, not only myself and, and other Republicans, but Democrats as well. Uh, ideally, you know, I think the midterms uh, will change the, the the leadership in the House and maybe give them an opportunity for uh, for the presidency to work work with uh, Congress on some of these solutions. Uh, but also, I'd say it starts in Congress. I've been working extremely hard to to keep Title 42 in place. And what you're starting to see is there's Democrats on board as well that want to keep that. So I wouldn't give up on Title 42 just yet. Can you kind of describe for people who are not from border areas and don't really understand what it is you're talking about when you talk about the border chaos? Like, what does that mean? What is what are some like concrete examples of what that looks like and 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 why that concerns people? Yeah, I'll give you three personal stories that have just stayed with me. Uh, I've spent a lot of time on this crisis and I, I've gone I've gone to Mexico, visited Juarez, I, all, I mean, countless trips. I've hosted 10 congressional delegations. Uh, uh, down at the border, but three particular stories come in mind. One, uh, just recently we had a National Guardsman who was 22 years old drown at the border. He was stationed there to help uh, provide security for the border. He sees two people fall into the river and he takes his body armor off and he jumps into the river. And, you know, sadly, current takes him away. He drowns. The, the two people were saved. They turn out to be drug smugglers. But this young man, 22 years old from Arlington, his name is Bishop Evans, he drowned. This young man had served in Iraq, he'd served in Kuwait, and then he gets killed in the southern border. That's one story. Another story, it's Christmas Day, 
And on Christmas, our family, we spend it by, um, by uh, opening up our presents on Christmas Eve. So Christmas Day is kind of a relaxed day. So on Christmas Day, I asked my family, hey, can we do our tradition, our, our regular tradition, but on Christmas Day, will you allow me to go out and visit with Border Patrol? And they absolutely did. So we did that. And I went to uh, six different spots. Well, one spot was Del Rio. And there, you know, it was eight o'clock in the morning and there was already over a hundred migrants that were getting processed. And there was this, this one woman, she was probably in her thirties, late twenties. And she had a little boy that was about four years old. And she's gripping that little boy's hand as tight as possible. All I can think of was, Imagine what that young man has gone through. Uh, those are the type of stories. The last one, I'll be really brief. You know, it's last weekend, it was over 102 degrees in South Texas, and people are being smuggled in trunks, in box carts. It's very sad. It's very humane. People are dying every single day at the border from Border Patrol agents, I mean, from uh, National Guardsmen to everyday migrants. It, it's very sad. And those are the stories that people aren't hearing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, we only have a little bit of time, but I do want to ask you how the debate over Roe versus Wade is playing out in your district. Yeah, I'm, I'm Catholic. I have six children. You can imagine where I fall on that debate. I would say there's a lot of, of, of my constituents are, are in the same boat. They're Catholic. They believe in life. I would say, you know, we can be different. This country can be different. We can have discussions, but there shouldn't be protests in, at churches or at people's homes, elected officials' homes. We need to get back to bringing this country to get together and doing it in a civil manner. And, and I think I think that's where we need to be. You know, my, my district is certainly very pro-life, though. And is this something that gets them out to vote? Is this an issue that that drives ballots? I don't think I really don't think so. I, I think, you know, they're focused on the border. They're focused on the cost of, of things. I think when you start talking about, uh, you know, some of the abortion things, it, it turns a lot of people off. I think it's a valid discussion, but I think it turns a lot of people off, especially in the rural communities or those along the border. In the cities, that's a different story. I think maybe you ignite the liberal base a little bit more. But a lot of my district in the rural areas, they're just trying to put food on the table, get their children to school, you know, make sure things are safe. You know, they, those kitchen uh, kitchen table items is is at the forefront of their minds. Gotcha. Well, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a great conversation. Uh, we really appreciate your time, Congressman. Great. Thank you. Anytime. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for another virtual conversation that has made everyone smarter, faster. To learn more about issues impacting the Latino community and news on the primaries, please visit axios.com slash newsletters or the Axios app. And please scan the QR code shown on screen to subscribe to Axios Latino if you haven't already. Thank you all for joining and we'll see you on Axios.com.